Lord, I come to you this morning with this word that you've laid on my heart. And God, I know that you know a beginning from the end and everything in between. And Father, as we talk about what it means to be born again and what it doesn't mean, God, I just pray that you would speak to different people, both here and that are online, Lord, they would hear your word very clearly and that you would help me to present it in a way that's honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was contemplating on starting a new series, but I had this, um, oh yeah, thank you. Thanks. I was contemplating on starting a new series, but as I was praying and, uh, and working on it, it just it felt like, no, not yet. So I kind of refocused my, uh, my thoughts, and, and I felt led to, um, to talk to you about um, born-again experience. Are you a born-again Christian? What does that mean, and what doesn't that mean? And that's essentially how this message, as I was preparing it, unfolded. So it's a new year, and many of us are considering how the next year of our lives are, are going to um, unfold and how we're going to live them out. And I know for a fact there's been several people in our congregation over the last year that have experienced new life in Jesus for the first time. And that's awesome, and we will be planning for a baptismal service here in the next little while. So if you haven't been baptized uh, and you would like to be baptized, I'd like to talk to you. Um, I want to have a baptismal class with anyone that wants to uh, step forward in obedience to the Lord in the waters of baptism. So there's been some, a couple of people that have, re- uh, have uh, made new decisions in our assembly. And um, there's other, other people that have freshly rededicated their lives to serving the Lord. And, um, and it's possible that maybe... There's some here today that you've been listening and you've been searching and you've been thinking about the possibility about becoming a Christian, but you haven't, up, haven't made up your mind yet. Well, I thank the Lord that, uh, that his word goes forward and there is an invitation for anyone who doesn't know the Lord to make this year the first year of your born-again experience. Well, what is a born-again experience, Pastor Clint? A lot of people that haven't read the Bible don't really totally get this. But most of us here this morning have settled the question and have yielded our spirits to the Creator. We've turned away from our former way of life and we've come to embrace new life in, in Him. And this morning I'd like to discuss with you what a genuinely saved Christian is and isn't. For those of you who've come to believe in Jesus, um, in the words of the Apostle Paul, to the church in Ephesus, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 7, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So then, when we read that passage, okay, it's, it's loaded. I mean, you can see it. Every single line is packed with some really powerful truth. 
You see, the purpose of God's salvation plan was to save us from his wrath on sin. God is holy. And his wrath is towards sin. Anything that is not holy, God's wrath is towards. And the scriptures tell us that the penalty of our sins is eternal death and separation from him. And this is what the scripture I just read to you from Ephesians is speaking about. You see, prior to uh, intervention by God, we were lost and separated from him by our sins. But through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross by faith, through God's grace, we give Jesus Christ our lives and he saves us from the penalty of our sins. The penalty of sin is death. Death eternally. And when we are justified by God, when we ask Jesus into our hearts, the Bible says we are justified, made just as if we had never sinned. And this is where we can rejoice. Aren't you glad that you've been justified if you've made this decision? That you've made just as if you'd never sinned? That God's taken your sin and cast it as far as east is from the west? Aren't you glad for that today? Amen? Amen? That's something to be excited about. And if it doesn't excite us, we need to reevaluate what it means to be a believer. We don't deserve this, but God, nevertheless, in his mercy, he has given it to us. But you see, this is where some people think that it stops. To them, faith in Christ is only about being saved from the death penalty of the fires in hell. But friends, if we stop here, the Christian experience is viewed merely as purchasing, and I've said this before, purchasing fire insurance. It's something that guarantees that we will not be consumed by God's wrath on judgment day in the fires of hell. However, friends, this is not the total package of God's salvation. See, if we stop short, we miss out on such an important point. Although God's purpose in sending Jesus to us was to offer salvation from the penalty of sin, God not only gives us immeasurable grace, and that's what it takes to save us, to save us from the penalty of our sins by justifying us, but Jesus also gives immeasurable grace to save us from the power of sin, which is what we refer to as sanctification. To be sanctified means to be set apart for God's holy purposes and to be made holy by him. In other words, God gives us his immeasurable grace to change us on the inside so that we change our patterns of sinful living to holy living. And when it comes to sanctification, God invites us on a journey of partnering with him. The power of sin over us has been broken by the work of Jesus. We're no longer under compulsion to sin any longer because the power has been broken. Now we freely choose what we do with God's immeasurable grace to change us. We have decisions to make. We have a partnership that God invites us to in a relationship with him. And we can either yield to the sanctifying work of God in what he's doing inside of us by the power of his Holy Spirit, or we can resist that. And this is why the, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His perfect, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And what, pray tell, is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for us? It is 
no less than being sanctified, becoming sanctified, and being conformed to the holy nature of the Lord Jesus Christ in how we carry out our lives in this world, what we do with our bodies here. The Apostle Peter speaks to the issue of sanctification when he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So the process by which we experience sanctification is instantaneous when we come to Christ. When we're saved by the Lord, He changes us inside and He sets us apart, in fact, for His holy purposes. So there's an instantaneous part to this. But still, there is a progressive element to it as well that once we have been saved... God desires a, to do a continuous work of transforming grace inside of us. He wants to continue reforming and refining our character so that we begin to act and look more and more like Jesus. This is why believers in the early church, the first big church outside of Jerusalem was in Antioch. And in Antioch, the believers Began to be, they began to call the believers Christians in Antioch, in the early church. And you know what Christian means? Christian means Christ-like one. If you say, I'm a Christian, in fact, you're saying, I am a Christ-like one. Imitators of him in character. Friends, God desire, desires to reform and conform our character to be holy just like Jesus is holy. See, God, I, I hear people saying, I'm a sinner. Yes, in your nature, your old nature, you are. But God is in the business of turning sinners into saints. And you are a saint instantaneously when you come to Christ because his blood covers over your sin and he places his robes of righteousness over top of you so that it is no longer you that live but Christ that lives in you. And that seed of the spirit inside of you, God desires that that transform your life so that it reflects the glory of God on every front. Every single part of our life God desires to reflect his glory on and through. He wants you to understand who you are in him and start acting like it. And he gives you the provision to do it. You see? In Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 19, Paul tells the believers there, he says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, Christ reconciles us to himself and he gives all of us as his children a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely, I am. I'm supposed to be. Further to what I'm saying in this point, you see, if you see someone that's struggling, it's, it's our responsibility in love to talk to them about what's going on. With, with a heart of love, to see that person saved from all of the trouble and the problems that are associated with disobedience. 
So yes, we are our brother's keeper, and it is proper for us to do it. But we must watch out, because who here is willing to be spoken to in your life, in my life? Am I willing to be spoken to in my life if something that I'm doing is out of line, out of sync? I ought to be. See, as a body of believers, we're a family, and we ought to be with one another, bearing with one another's burdens, and sometimes that means sharing concerns. Not out of a judgmental spirit, but out of a genuine heart of koinonia, love and friendship. This is the way of Christ. Further to what I'm saying on this point, Paul tells his companion church leader Titus in Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. I'm going to repeat that again. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to freedom, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You catch the, diff- you catch the connection between justification and sanctification in that passage I just read? This is God's will. But sadly, some are eager to be saved from the penalty of sin, but not so eager to be saved from the power of sin. Some want to continue to have control over their own lives, to live how they want to live without yielding their fleshly behaviors and sinful living to Jesus. Now, if you find yourself in this camp, God is the one that you've got to answer to, right? Only God knows what's happening behind closed doors. And anyone can put on masks, right? Some want control over their own lives to continue living how they live. If you find yourself in this camp, I have a question for you. Now, I'm not saying you don't mess up sometimes, right? Because that's not what this is all about here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But if you find yourself in this camp where you are bound by sinful living in behind the closed door all the time, you have to ask yourself, have you ever truly given your heart to Jesus Christ for real? Have you ever truly repented of your sins? We know that the Bible says that for one to be saved, they must believe in Jesus and confess him as their Savior. The kids learn this in Awana. Romans 10.9, we're told by Paul how to be saved. He said, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But on the point of faith, what is true saving faith? Some say faith stands alone without having any actions accompanying it. After all, we do believe that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. All of us at this church here in leadership. That's what we attest to, and we believe that. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ. But faith alone, without works, the Bible teaches that it is not true saving faith. What I'm trying to say is this. It's best for me to go right to the scripture and point you to the word. This is a very important matter for us to settle. James says this, the apostle James says this in James chapter 2, 18 to 24, but if someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works and I will show you you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. 
But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac to his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. This troubled some theologians of the past. As a matter of fact, there were some that said, should James be even in the Bible because of this? But what I, I think we need to get this. There are some who say that they have faith and that they are saved by grace alone through faith alone but continue to live a life of sin without repentance. You, if you are in that camp, if you're leaning on that, you're on various dangerous footing, my friend. You see, true saving faith demonstrates itself through good works. In other words, you can't have salvation without repentance. That's what this is saying. You can't have salvation without repentance. The two go hand in hand. But I do have faith, someone might say. I do believe in Jesus. I believe that he is the Son of God. Well, don't you know that Satan and his demons also believe the same thing? They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that the Bible is God's word. They believe and they tremble. Why do they tremble? Because their faith, their belief, you see, that's faith. That's a kind of faith. To know that God is who he says he is and to know that what he says is the truth. That is a type of faith. But that is not saving faith that we're talking about when God says that you you come to Christ through grace alone by faith alone. Or faith alone, grace alone, either way. God's grace, having faith. God enables you to believe, and you have faith. See, Satan and their demons, and the demons that follow him, they do not submit or repent, even though they know the truth. So such a person who claims to follow Christ but walks in darkness lies to him or herself if they think that their brand of faith will bring them salvation. It is not true saving faith. It is, in fact, demonic faith. In Hebrews 10, 26, 31, we are told the truth of this matter. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and is who insulted the, the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That right there is much scripture as it is in Ephesians. It's, t- it's not contradictory. It's not contradictory to the passage of, Ephes- of Ephesians that talks about being saved by grace through faith. That is not a contradiction. It is a clarification of what saving faith actually is and what it isn't. What being born again is and what it isn't. If we continue in the pattern of wickedness after coming to a knowledge of the truth, we are insulting the spirit of grace. I believe today there needs to be more than acknowledgement of the person and work of Jesus in some people's hearts. If you're listening online, maybe this is speaking to you. And we need to to submit ourselves to the truth of God's word and to the truth that the Holy Spirit brings. There is a progressive brand of Christianity out there that is absolutely false. It is giving people false hope. And there's going to be people on the judgment day that are going to stand in front of the throne of God and God is going to look at them and they're going to say, 
And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And they're like, well, didn't we do this, that, and the other thing in your name? We even did miracles in your name, Lord. We spoke in different tongues. We did all kinds of things. And he's like, I never knew you. I never knew you. Reason it being is that people misunderstand what it means to be a born-again Christian. Being a born-again Christian is living a life of repentance before a holy God. Because if your heart's changed, truly changed by the Spirit inside of you, you will be pulled towards holiness because He is holy. And if the Holy Spirit, holy underlined, Spirit lives inside of you, He will compel you to holy living. And if you're not compelled to any holy living, and if you're out there doing everything that you want to do without considering how it makes God feel, you have to question the validity of your experience. There's some repenting that needs to be done. Think about that for a minute. John, the Apostle John, speaks to this. In 1 John 3, 5 to 10, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who continues, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No, the one who continues to sin has either, has either, uh, sorry, no one who continues to see, sin has either seen him or known him. Did you hear that? Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Did you hear that? God wants to destroy the dominion of sin over us so that we're not only saved from the penalty of sin, but we're saved from the power of sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know the children of, who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Wow. This is sobering. You know why? Because there's not a person who sits in this place that doesn't fall into sin sometimes. As I spoke before, the scripture... Is it saying that a person who is a true Christian never commits sin? No, that's not what it's saying. All of us from time to time fall into temptation and, and sin. And we have to evaluate when that happens, what happened? How did I let my guard down? No, what John is saying here is, is that nobody who is a true Christian will continue to live in an unbridled, pattern of sin without a heart of repentance. That's what it's saying. The big issue that we see in North American Christianity today is that many people come to Jesus and there is much remorse when they come to him. They know that they are sinners and are sad about what they have done and about how that sin has affected and broken their lives. So they tell Jesus that they are sorry for the way they are living and they even shed tears in prayer at altars. But they are unwilling to change. You see, the remorse for the sin is not accompanied by repentance. And God isn't just calling to us for remorse, to say, I'm sorry. I can have remorse and say, I'm sorry, all I want, and continue to live the way I, continued, the way I was living before. That's not what God desires. He desires repentance. For instance, couple of scenarios. Remember that rich young boy who came up alongside of Jesus and says, I want to follow you, Lord? Well, Jesus, of course, is God, so he sees into this, boy, this guy's heart and says, yeah, yeah, you can come follow me. First, I want you to go and give everything that you have away to the poor. Then come and follow me. Huh. The man went away sad, full of remorse, full of remorse. But he never came back to Jesus because the cost that he asked him to pay was too much. So he just walked away with remorse but no repentance. Judas, Iscariot, 
walked with Christ, with the other 11, saw Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Judas even went out when Jesus sent him out and did miraculous signs and wonders in the power of the Lord. And yet when it came down to it, he betrayed Jesus. And then when he betrayed Jesus, he had a great deal of remorse, didn't he? He went back into the temple. He realized that he had betrayed innocent blood and he tried to give the money that he had taken to sell Jesus out back to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. And they took it, but they wouldn't put it in the temple or treasury. They bought a field where people were buried. And Judas was so filled with remorse. He was so filled with remorse. What have I done? I've betrayed the Son of God. I've betrayed innocent blood. He was filled with remorse. But what did he do? Did he go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. I've betrayed you, Lord, and I need your mercy. No, no, he didn't. Judas continued walking in his remorse and he went out and took matters into his own hands to clear his own conscience, did it his own way, and he killed himself. See, Judas was not saved because Judas did not repent. Judas was remorseful, but Judas didn't repent. May we not be like that rich young man or Judas. When God convicts us of sin, may our remorse for our wickedness lead us to repentance like Peter who denied Christ three times and then went back to the Lord. And then he repented and the Lord brought him back in and actually made him little rock on which he established the church. He established it on Petra himself, but Peter was part of that as the foundation. 1 John 1, 5 to 10, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him and there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and live, do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, here is the caveat to this, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You see the connection here? Koinonia, fellowship, love of brethren amongst one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So this is hope for us sometimes when we stumble, when we come crashing down, because sometimes we do, and we need mercy. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So what this is saying is it's not saying that we walk in a pattern of sin, but when we do inevitably stumble, fall into sin, we have an advocate who steps up forward on our behalf and his blood covers our sin. So we are under his grace, his protection of grace. But his will isn't that we continue in the pattern of sin. See, God desires for us to be purified and to draw closer to him and become more like him. And this is the progressive nature of our sanctification. Do you have room to grow in your faith yet? Say, I, I, I have room to grow in my faith. The, f- the further I walk along the road of, of Christ, the more I see that I need to be more like him. <laughs> We have so much more to learn. And if we have so much more to learn, that means we're not doing things perfectly, are we? So we need his grace. We need his grace. We need his grace for salvation and we need his grace for sanctification as well. To be made further and further conformed to the image of Christ. Examine yourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. So every one of us need to examine ourselves. Am I in the faith, Lord? Am I really, have I really repented of my sin and come to follow you, or do I need to do that? There is a marked change in a person's behavior pattern when they truly come under the blood of Christ. You cannot be the same person 
when the Holy Spirit makes his residence inside of you, he will transform you by the renewing of your mind. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 11 to 13, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated by the light illuminated becomes a light. So Paul makes it very clear to the, the, the people in Corinth, for instance, that were struggling with the different issues of sin in their ungodly society, much like we have here. He says this, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, or you, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. This is a list some people would say this is dogmatic and legalistic and bigoted. No, this is God's word. This is a list that God made. Listen to this. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Is it talking about those who mess up and fall down? No. Those, this is talking about people who live a pattern of living, unsurrendered to Christ in these areas, completely unsurrendered. Those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. That's what some of you were. Who here was a terrible sinner before they came to Christ? That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified, set apart for a holy purpose, right? You were justified, made just as if you were never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Friends, God is calling us to submit our lives to him in service to him. Jesus, take this heart. Do what you want with it, Lord. Make me to be a holy person that glorifies you wherever I go. I repent, Lord, from anything that I have done or anything. I repent of that, Lord. And I ask God that you strengthen me. Forgive me when I fall, Lord, because you know how weak I am. There's times, God, when I really struggle. Forgive me, Lord. Bring me back to where I started, I open up my heart to you. God will give you overcoming power. If you're here today and you've never actually received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that today and he will give you overcoming power. If you're a Christian that's struggling with different issues, he can give you overcoming power. The more closely you draw to God, the less appealing the things of the flesh are gonna be. You want to be overcomer? In Christ, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Wash your ha hands, you sinners. Purify your minds. You double-minded. This is what the scripture says, right? Talking to me, talking to you. It's, it's talking about going into partnership, submitting to the partnership that God has brought to you. You're not under the dominion of darkness. You're not under the slavery of sin. You don't have to listen to the devil. You don't have to listen to the flesh temptations that you have. You do not have to because you're not under law. You are under grace. And grace has saved you through faith. And that faith is saving faith. That faith has enabled God's spirit to wash you clean and cleanse you and fill you. And this is not of yourselves. It's a work of Christ in you. Shine. Shine. Shine and be the people of God. Go into the world around you with the gospel and live like a believer. There's no need to walk in disobedience any longer. Titus 3, and I'll end with this. 3 to 7. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. 
But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. See, rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. In other words, he's called you to his kingdom. He's called you as, to be his children. He's called you to be sons and daughters of the king. You are heirs. You're heirs. Co-heirs with Christ. Why? Because God has decreed it. Because God has had mercy upon you and me. So let's live like heirs instead of like the world. Amen? 2024 can be a new start in your Christian walk. You're not going to be able to do this by just working it out in your own strength. No. If you try to do that, you're going to fail. You need to yield to the Spirit. Yield to the Lord. Pursue God, and He will draw near to you. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your blood. Thank you for the blood applied. Without that, Lord, there'd be none of us here that could stand. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that, that is applied. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed us white. Thank you, Jesus, you have brought us out of darkness into your glorious light. Thank you, Jesus, that we no longer have to live as captives to our sin nature any longer. We've been given freedom in you by your grace, and we thank you, Lord, that you've given us saving grace and you've given us sanctifying grace. And you continue to help us, Lord, in our need. For you know we are a needy people, Lord. God, we make New Year's resolutions and we can't keep them in our own strength. So, Father, we just pray that this resolution, Father, would be just that we would yield to you and draw close to you. And when we yield and draw close to you, God, you'll empower us to be overcomers. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.